Rodriguez, and I am the camp co-lead for Que Viva Camp, and we are a social justice and racial justice camp at Burning Man. Really excited to um, lead a conversation today with two of my campmates. Um, Desert Flower um, is a healing, does healing-centered liberation work that includes facilitation, diversity, training, and spiritual direction. Uh, they've been to Burning Man three times, and they're a core part of our camp running systems and infrastructures. Uh, camp Daddy uh, does racial equity-based leadership and organizational change consulting and training, has been to Burning Man five years, um, and is also going to be part of today's discussion. I've been to Burning Man seven years. Our camp is seven years old, and it was co-founded by amazing social justice leaders like Dolores Huerta, who is the leader of the um, farm workers, the UFW, together with Cesar Chavez. Um, and and the, the kind of foundational, hi, welcome, welcome. Please come in. Um, so so uh, before we get started, it would be great if we could just uh, go around um, and say your name uh, and your pronoun. Um, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and dive into some questions. OK, and one more piece with that. We have this little fancy, funky uh, recording machine. So we're going to use this as a bit of a talking piece. So as it goes around, this side is the side that you want to record in. If you want to say something and you don't necessarily want it to be recorded, you can just hit the little record button while you're speaking or before you speak. And then before you pass it on to the next person, hit it again so it'll start for them. That's if you don't want to be recorded. Right. OK, great. Right. Um, so yeah, so I am Desert Flower, also known as Jahan, also um, known as they. Hi, I'm Camp Daddy. Um, my mother calls me Lorenzo when I behave. Um, and um, uh, he, him. Hi, I'm Witch, also known as Rose. Um, she, her. Luna, uh, my name is Tamara in the default world, and she, her. Uh, wouldn't say no, uh, John, he, him. <laughs> uh, Miriam and traditional female pronouns are totally fine. Molly Rose, she, her. Um, Gracie, her, hers, she. William, he, him. Shamrina, she, her. Shahar, but most, most people know me as Sunshine. Leslie, she, her. Katie, she, her. Black Beauty, uh, he. Nipple Butt or Alex, she, her. Keys or Steven, he, his. Excited, she, her. Uh, whatever, Scott, um, he, him, or if I like you, you can Say packet. <laughs> Sprout or Megan, she, her. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this important conversation. Um, what we will be talking today is really racial inclusion at Burning Man. Um, and I want to encourage everyone to just um, move through this discussion with ease and um, embrace. Join us. Ah, yeah, we're good. We're perfect. Thank you. Um, that some of the things we will uh, bring up and talk about are challenging things to discuss, uh, and just that part of transformation is discomfort, so that we let, let's really try to, to hold that and also be aware of, of our feelings as they come up, um, and also be aware of the space we choose to take up or, or not. So I'll start a little bit with some context setting. Um, and that is that um, for, for many of us who've been attending Burning Man as people of color, we have noticed that there's a significant issue with diversity on Playa. Um, what the data tells us is that people of color make up 9% of Playa, um, and that the largest demographic to attend Burning Man is from California. 52% of people from California, excuse me, 52% of attendees are from California. California is also one of the most diverse states in the country with 40% people of color. So although um, we're pulling from one of the most diverse regions, uh, Burning Man as a whole has not, um, 
has consistently, consistently been under 10%, which doesn't even really reflect the country, nevertheless, uh, the world. The other thing um, is that uh, we are at a moment right now where the traditional systems of white, hetero, male supremacy are dismantling, and they're also before our very eyes, right? And whether that's the administration, whether it's the birth of movements like Black Lives Matter, or the recent massacres we witnessed in New Zealand, that the conversation on race and who gets centered and who gets seen as the other is now front and center of our national dialogue. Um, at the same time, uh, Burning Man, which is now, how old is Burning Man? 30, 32 years old. Um, we, we, are, we are a part of a community uh, that has for years positioned themselves as sort of on the cutting edge and this place of um, radical thinking and especially radical inclusion. And so um, for a few years now, uh, many, many of us, especially as, as leaders of color, have really gotten together to think about how do we address this with the organization, but also especially at a time when inclusion and equity is now part of the normal conversation. Um, the train is moving. And either Burning Man's going to get on that train or they're not. And so we are here to really help lead and facilitate a conversation around what can be done um, Many of us, we, we, Burning Man is a big part of our identity, but it also, um, it's a space in, in, in urgent need of, of transformation. Um, and and we, in, at our camp, we feel that uh, the issue of racial inclusion, which is really an element of radical inclusion, is something that can be front and center. Great, welcome folks, thank you. I'm so glad more folks are, are joining us. Yeah, that after lunch thing is yeah. Deal. Great. So, so with that, this is a very timely conversation, and with what we discussed today, um, we're really hoping both in in your with your allyship and really with we, we can't transform Burning Man without the core people who make up um, Burning Man. And so, what we'll be talking about today is everything from. Um, radical inclusion through a racial justice lens. Um, what have been some of the historical barriers? What are things that people of color have experienced on Playa? What are some ways that we can really call in uh, white allyship and white co-conspirators to help us transform Playa? Um, and everything from cultural appropriation to anti-blackness, and, and we'll, we'll be talking about all of that stuff. So we're gonna be having, uh, I'll be asking uh, my two campmates such some questions to get us started for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll move into a group dialogue, and we'll close with a call to action and next steps. How does that sound? Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just, uh, there's a statistic I just wanted to add to what you said right. around African-American. Oh, yes, please, like please. Right. in this room. <clears throat> Burning Man has gotten more colorful, but it has not gotten more black. Mm. Um, black African American representation at Burning Man has hovered between 0.7% and 1.1%. Um, yes. It's going up and down. So right. what's interesting to right. consider is we, in this room right now, we are 8 to 12 times you know, more representative of the African American community in California and the US um, than the burn as a whole. So yeah. I think that, that is just really important right. to make sure those statistics are really clear. That's correct. Our camp mate, Stephen Thrasher, actually wrote an article. It's called The One Percenters, The Black Burners. Um, and it's going to come up in our conversation because in reality, you know, um, we, we believe that the liberation of black people is the liberation of all of us. Uh, we're in the Bay Area. This is the home of one of the most radical black movements, the Black Panther Party. And just we, we are going to be discussing that, which is what, when we mean diversity, what do we really mean? Um, and how do we move forward on specifically including um, black folks, indigenous folks, Latinx folks who are among the, the least represented. So great. So to kick us off, um, Johanna and Lorenzo, we know that Burning Man is called oh so white. Like number one thing when we invite our friends of color to join, why you go to that, why, there's too many white people there. So what keeps you going back to Burning Man? What is it that draws you about it? Why is it a place um, uh, uh, where you wanna put in your time and energy? 
Um, I'm loving starting with this because I've been thinking a lot today. The first time I was invited to Burning Man, I was 17. I'm from the Bay Area, and it, this was back when it was still out in Baker Beach. It hadn't even gotten to Nevada yet. And my first response from my friend, I remember it was just like, nope, it's just way too many white people with no rules, which did not at all feel safe. It was the antithesis of my idea of safety in the world. So for all the reasons that he was completely right, that he was like, you would love it. People don't care. They're totally just doing whatever it is that they want to do. If you want to like hug the trees, there's no trees in Nevada, of course. But you know, like if that's what you want to do, you just go do that. And like he could see that connection, but it was what another decade before I felt like even Burning Man had caught up to where I was that I was like, okay, now I can consider going and just kind of tasting it out. But the things that keep me are the same things that my friend invited me to, you know, 20 years ago, that it was the space to just move at the pace that your being is organically set to move, whether that be very high, whether that be very low, whether it be in and out, it's just that flexibility to not be one thing and have that be supposed to be who you and what you are all the time like to get out of the static of just expectations of life. So that's that's what keeps me going back. Yeah, I uh, the first year I went to Burning Man, I went, uh, I was trying to, I was trying to develop a, a practice or a skill of being kind and not, because uh, I, I, you know, I'd coming out of my 20s and um, in my early 30s and just had really been trained on how to fight. Like I could pick a fight, I could, I could really go for, um, you know, and around rhetoric and around you know around race or issues of, of of queerness or intersectionality and just really like I was I was sharp I knew how to do it I could go for it and but that was that was not the type of human I wanted to be I wanted to learn how to be kind and I <clears throat> thought that the, the way to do that would be to to put myself in situations where the triggers would be really really high and would be coming at me constantly and I would have to uh, remain calm and I would have to kind of practice meditation of kindness. And um, I'd heard of Burning Man, I thought that would be an excellent place to go. And, um, and it was, and, and it is. And it is a place where I um, am constantly, constantly having, bring, bring, coming back to myself and, um, and trying to make sense of how humans are trying to make sense of themselves. Um, and and now, now that I'm there after you know, the first year, second year, and now you know, going on the sixth year, uh, I find myself also feeling really committed to creating space, making way for more people of color to have access, because it is, it is a fascinating, splendid, gorgeous experience to be had, um, despite right, um, so many of the challenges that we experience as people of color being there, and when you see um, traces of your ancestry uh, mocked or paraded, uh, desecrated, um, it, it's really painful, the trauma, like, it's really intense. Um, but I do think that there are possibilities for making the world bigger and particularly making Burning Man bigger. Um, and in fact, I love how we keep on growing uh, as people come in, that we I think that's part of the practice, right? We just keep on making space. We keep on making the world bigger for all of us. And then something to that. Um, I also want to add that the first time I came to Burning Man, I actually was not set to go back. It was like, oh, okay, now I get it. I went there, I did that. But the first time that I went, it was a very lovely camp that did that we offered empathic listening. So you could just come, drop in, tell your story, and just be really witnessed and held in that. And I was the only person of color. So not only the only black person, I was the only person of color in general. And it was just, I didn't feel unwelcome, but I didn't feel comfortable. And there's a difference. And it wasn't until Ashara invited me and was like, hey, you're like, again, somebody was like, you would like this Burning Man thing. And I was like, yeah, I've been there. I've done that. She was like, no, but have you done it with K-Viva? And I was like, no, I didn't even know that y'all were there when I was there the first time. And so I went back and it's really, K-Viva is such a big part of why I continue to go back. Because even with having the original experiences of like, yeah, okay, I get like that feeling and that flow and that melding it really wasn't until I had the grounding of the K Viva camp space and that intentionality, the explicitness and the commitment of it 
that it was like, okay, this is something I can then like attach to in a way that feels real and that feels like it'll hold me back. We're going to, let's unpack that um, in a second around what are the conditions that create safe and inclusive pl places. And I want to add just like as a, as a woman of color, uh, Latinx, I'm first generation American. My parents uh, were both very, very hardworking immigrants, like, you know, working 12 hour days regularly, that um, many of us come from communities where um, our ancestors and our people, uh, our people's bodies are commodified. I mean, if you look at the history of slavery, literally, the commodification of bodies, if you look at immigrant communities, um, the way that the Chinese were exploited to build the railroads, and that lives in your DNA. And your perspective of your bodily freedom is so tied to a capitalist system that has historically exploited you. Um, not to mention that many communities of color, especially black and brown, are among the poorest in this country. So the ability to engage in an experience that liberates your body is significant, and it's a privilege. Um, but it's also one of the most transformative things that can happen for people of color, to be able to be embodied and free um, is, 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 is significant, especially at a time when the majority of people, uh, the majority of people in our prisons are black and brown. There's a real limitation on bodily freedom. We know that around uh, from the data that black folks are more likely to get killed by the police or arrested or racially profiled. So I really want to stress that even the access to be able to be in a place where you can move freely is a huge privilege and we can begin to consider what are the conditions that allow people who need that transformation to, to go. Um, and I want to unpack what you said about going to Que Viva. Um, when, when I first went to Burning Man, I was mostly camping with white men. Um, but then when I got out to Playa, I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is some next level shit. And I first thing I thought is like, yo, why do white folks keep this to themselves? Like, I'm serious. I'm like, this is a secret. Y'all are keeping a secret. Okay, and I was like, I need to bring my people out here because we need to get free. Like, we, have, we need to get free. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, scribble, by the way. I'm taking pictures for your but okay. I'm still interested in this topic. Um, how much of this struggle is based on the experience of the event or how the event is marketed to you? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, let's pause on that. Let's, let's, well, yeah. The other question. well, we're not doing questions right now. We're doing facilitate discussion, and then we'll let open up for questions. Yeah. So um, what we had realized is just that the, that the ability for folks of color to attend Burning Man and to really feel in a space where they are safe, um, especially if you are a black queer femme, somebody who identifies as trans, perhaps somebody that it's your first time and you want to experiment with some um, stuff you've never tried before, that it's really important to kind of have a, a, a safe space. So what we began to do is then say, OK, why don't we begin to have workshops in the Bay Area that say, hey, folks of color, have you wanted to go to Burning Man? Do you want to understand why Burning Man is very white? And we can help you navigate that space. And we noticed that like dozens of people would show up to the events, to our events, and would sort of want support in learning how to navigate the space. But can you all talk about what do you think makes it so that we are having now a very successful sort of um, intervention where people of color can come to Burning Man. Um, some of them for the first time. Some of these are folks are like national leaders. You know, we, we're inviting folks who are leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement um, or leaders in, in, in their own communities. What do you think are the things that we're getting right about our camp that creates these kinds of uh, spaces where um, we have a majority like black, black women-led camp? Um, I think first thing is just having the conversation, calling the thing what it is, is the first step, is like the colorblindness does not work. It just is, is not a functional way to move through the world teaching yourself to not see the things that your eyeballs are designed to see, right? Like when you really break that down, it's kind of insane what's being asked of you. So it's just call the thing what it is. Be at that level of like radical realism to just genuinely observe what's happening and then have conversations about it. Like ask real questions. 
And the other part is just being intentional. Like once you have that sense, which K Viva does, like everybody brings their own homework to the table. So everybody comes with an understanding of systemic oppression. Like we don't have to spend the time helping people like Google these things. And that's kind of like, it's kind of, it can be kind of harsh, but it's my attitude. It's like, you know, if you have time to Google internet cat videos in the middle of the night, you have time to Google Audre Lorde and read what she has to say. You have time to read Angela Davis. You have time for that. It's a matter of priorities. And K Viva is very clear about what its priorities are from the leadership all the way down. And so that's communicated at every step of engagement with the camp is just that thoroughness of this is what we do, this is why we do it, and it's not, again, not to exclude anybody else, but like, you know, this is what we're here for, and that clarity is, I think, the thing that K Viva does the best. I think two two things that we do, uh, what I would, so I'm gonna say relationships and, and wholeness, and uh, as far as relationships that, um, People who are coming into the camp or who are brought into the camp are coming from the various circles that we move in. And I, I think that's you know a challenge that we hear from people like, well, how do I get more people of color to come to my camp? You know, I've been doing organizational development work for years and often boards are all white, you know, like how can we get people of color to join our, our board so they can have one and then it's a nightmare for that poor person. Um, but often we, we, we recruit, we access from from the spaces we move in, from our spheres, from our from like who, who do you roll with? And if, uh, and if who you roll with looks like the people who are at your camp or you know, in the case of organizations on your board, well, that makes sense, right? So, but it's, it's the, that commitment and that investment in, 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 in expanding and in really connecting with people who don't look like you, right? And people who experience the world differently um, because that, that just makes the world bigger, right? And that makes our world bigger. Um, and you know, I'm thinking of um, the brother who does um, uh, indigenous rights work in, in Ecuador, right, in the, in the Amazons. Um, and, um, you know, like, and just halidope and just like showed up and like, and throwing all kinds of knowledge that we, you know, for those of us who are U.S. based um, and those of us raised in the U.S., like it's a lot, uh, you know, because it's really, it feels really good to be, um, uh, to have what we know to be true as activists in the U.S. be completely uh, thrown on its head, right? So we have these opportunities to, to grow and to constantly push. Um, and then ar around wholeness that, all of who you are matters. That you matter. That that there isn't a part of you that that is that is brought into this. So that is you know your queerness um, matters, and your queerness matters because your queerness is racialized. You are a black queer person, like you are, and you are. So like the various the many ways in which you move through the world, you do that all at once here, and that matters to us. And so we want to make space. We want to make a camp big enough for all of us to fit whole. I think that's how you end up cultivating these cultures of belonging, where people feel like they're at home. We feel like they. They can belong. Great, and let's um, let's share a little bit about the strategies that we have seen work um, in our camp, as well as name some of the things which kind of are, are a little bit of blatant signs that the organization has work to do. Um, so last year, I don't know if anyone saw this. Last year, near Center Camp, there was a teddy bear hanging from a noose. Did anyone see that? Okay, I saw that, and I was like, "What the fuck?" You know, just who who approved who approved this? Um, and I also have seen uh, consistent um, lack of uh, any kind of position on um, people wearing headdresses, mm -hmm. which is also a huge uh, example of cultural uh, appropriation, but, and, and especially at a time when other gatherings have taken a bold stance on this. Um, and so the, we, we've seen incidents uh, like that, as well as camps like formerly known as Miso Horny, is that what they're called? really begin to understand that they were actually not representative of any kind of particular East Asian culture and that they began to unpack what their naming really meant and got into a discussion around shifting. So there's been sort of that kind of work. But let's talk about some of the things that we've offered that we've seen have some real uh, stickiness. Uh, so whether it's the banners that say Black Lives Matter and that show the faces of people like Sandra Bland or Oscar Grant, um, that has, uh, we have almost been a magnet for people of color when you put up that kind of um, symbolism, as well as white allyship workshops. Can you talk about what have you noticed in the white ally workshops that the, the Burning Man community is sort of hungry or curious about? What are you noticing? What are you both noticing insofar as um, what, what 
yeah, what are the curiosities um, and, and, and what are even maybe some of the points of, of tension? Do you want to go first, Phil? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first year that I came, I, I put out a workshop and it was called How to Be Friends with Brown People. And it was, I swear, like every brown person on the playa showed up. And because they just saw brown people. And so they just responded. They missed that it was actually about for allies. <laughs> and it turned into a different workshop. But one of the things that happened that was so rare, and I, was, I felt so grateful as a facilitator to have this moment, it really felt just like a gift from the playa, was that it was a moment where people of color outnumbered white people in the space. And that was something, just the visceral experience of what your body does outside of what your mind is trying to control it and tell it to do so that you'll be the good person that your internalized image of you needs to have reflected back at you and all of that stuff. It was just like, oh, no, we have a body and this is where these experiences live from. This is where prejudice is acted out from. This is where welcome is experienced from. And all of that with people were just able to kind of get into it. And one of the things that I've heard from both that workshop and like all the years since is just the desire to understand. Like there really is a desire to understand that experience that is so hard to have unless you go through it with your body. There's only so much data that you can tell somebody about your lived experience that is going to translate into something really meaningful. And it's not about the other person being wrong. It's just we're, we're not designed to, to intake information in that way and have that kind of experience. So I really, I find the desire for understanding, the desire for connection is really strong. And there's just some of those like conditioned blocks that show up, like the, the need to see oneself as a good, especially good white person. Um, I honestly, I have nothing inside of me that's like, I need to go be a good black person in the world. That's not a conversation that I have inside of myself. But, you know, it makes sense that it wouldn't be. <laughs> and why the other conversations are what they are. But just, yeah, that desire to like reach across and really live like some of the Burning Man principles of like that. And this is a thing I like, I feel like I'm, going like a little tangential, but it wraps around to me. Like when I think about this question of like, who is your we? Like very often I see people show up and they have this kind of like agape sense of love for the whole world. And it's like, that's great. We also need that. But we also need like very specific concrete acts of love. What does that look like in between individual people? If I come to you and I say, hey, this person just did a thing to me do you question my perception of reality or do you show me love for my humanity in that moment and say, man, that sucked. What can I do to help you feel better? Because that's, but that's the place of the missed connection so often when I'm dealing with white conditioned folks is that they'll jump in with the, a kind of defensiveness of something that they're not even totally aware that they're defending and my humanity just gets put on the sidebar and that interpersonal connection gets lost. So it's like the desire is there, but there really is some kind of like living practiced capacity that seems to be the stumbling block again and, and again and again. And so I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna actually have another follow-up question before I open it up um, for, for group questions. And I'll also give just some guidelines on what kind of questions to ask because um, we're, we, we just, we're, we're not trying to do like a lot of emotional labor either. Uh, so, okay. Camp Daddy, you train organizations all around the country around racial equity and inclusion. What are um, top you know, three sort of key advice that you would give to camps who have mostly white identified folks? What are some ways that they can begin to transform? Three strategies. So one, I think it would be committing to uh, cultivating a culture of belonging. And um, with that, um, to begin moving with, uh, with the mindfulness of what do I do and how is it that I move through the world 
that makes it possible for other people to experience a sense of belonging? And what do I do that disrupts people's ability to feel a sense of belonging? And so like there is a, um, that yes, we have agency, we get to, you know, we have a radical self-expression, we, we get to move through the world, um, you know, expressing as we want, um, and, and the we, the we being subject, right? The, the we changes depending on the context, right? Um, I certainly do here, um, but um, you know, majority of my family wouldn't get to do this, right? So it really depends. Um, and um, and then uh, with that commitment to cultural belonging, like how do you make a world bigger, so that more people can fit and they they can fit wholly that they that all of who they are can be in the room. And then then as you, you know, get deeper into it, and you know you start to realize like oh when I do this. When I wear this particular uh, piece of clothing, it seems to interrupt other people's ability to feel a sense of belonging. Is it worth it? Is it worth it for me that someone experienced distress, that it triggers um, you know, some kind of historical trauma? But it, like, is it worth it for me? Not whether or not I'm going to value whether or not that's true, their experience is real, but is it worth it to me? Am I, in fact, committed to creating a bigger world? Great. Um, so let's go ahead and open up, up to questions. So, so here's what I would say is first, we'll take three questions at a time, and I encourage you to keep it at, you know, 30 seconds to um, a minute. Often, uh, it, when we've had workshops like this in the past at Burning Man gatherings, um, there is a lot of white men who get up and they will start talking about their marginalized identities and why we're just, um, that there's actually just an easy fix to this. So I really just want to honor that white supremacy is real, racism is real, and we are not here to discuss whether or not racism exists on Playa. Racism exists in every part unless it is actively dismantled. Um, so in your questions, please also, um, it, let's, let's have them be questions, not um, statements about marginalized, um, I, uh, your, your own uh, experience with, with being marginalized, because again, we're here to center strategies um, to invite more people of color to uh, be a part of a very transformative global gathering. Um, and in doing so, it will transform the whole gathering. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so let's go ahead, we'll take three questions and then we can discuss, yeah. Yeah, and well, they, or yeah, they, they they can be to us. I mean, if there's something you wanna uh, discuss, but I feel like we have a bunch of expertise here. So, yeah, we'll, yeah. Yeah, I just have a quick. It's my framing. I'm a framing nerd. I love perspectives, windows. But I would say to that, there actually white supremacy is not real. People who believe in white supremacy are real, but white supremacy is not real. And I think we don't do ourselves a favor by repeating the statement again and putting that in our bodies in a way that reinforces a thing that is not a thing. So it's perpetuated by <laughs> Great. So let's rotate. Okay, cool. How about we go shooting down So my question is around not just the event, but the community surrounding, you know, going on throughout the year. Um, you know, I would say that even more than the actual event itself, what's been transformative for me about the Burning Man community as a former fundamentalist missionary who moved to California, leaving that life with $200 in his pocket um, and explored my bisexuality like in the context of a very safe, supportive community for years before I even went to the burn. It was the burning community that let me have some of these experiences of being seen for parts of myself I hadn't even accepted yet. Um, and I'm curious about, um, you know, if you have ideas or thoughts, if you're seeing ways, you know, where people's community experience as people and burners of color um, kind of supports those communities off playa. I think of just the systematic discrimination of neighborhoods. You know, I live in San Francisco um, where uh, like Bayview right now is crumbling and this community is being shredded and my head goes like, do burners just want to go down there and like party in a warehouse and then leave? Like how, how invigorating could like a black burner community that's supported like be for the fabric, you know, of that community in that space. So that's, I, I don't know if that's happening anywhere or if you want that to happen, but I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Oh, oh, I do actually. Have, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about um, the intersectionality between ascribed identities and elective identities. So um, I'd really be curious to hear um, the experience of having a salient elective identity when you have so many ascribed identities and just learning a little bit more about what that experience is. Um, just speaking on, you know, you created a camp um, to bring in more people uh, from people of color uh, to Burning Man and get the word out and kind of show them that there is a space. What kind of expectations do you have from the Burning Man organization to assist you or get out of your way or, you know, have resources uh, without feeling like you're, you know, being targeted per se, but allowing you to know that you have a support system um, there to kind of get the word out and bring more people in. Um, so we have had a number of conversations with the Burning Man board and with staff members. So the good news is that there's a lot of staff members within Burning Man who are anti-racist and who actually teach white ally workshops who are very active. Um, in white allyship. So there's already a base of folks there. The board is pretty much all white. There's no black identified folks on the board. There's a, a, a person who identifies as Asian, um, and I think that, that that's it. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but um, Larry Harvey, uh, before he died, a few years before he died, was quoted as saying, black people don't come to Burning Man because they don't like to camp. So, um, and, and any time that we, that we or other people would try to bring up racial inclusion as, an ex, as, a, as radical inclusion, because ra radical inclusion is racial inclusion, like this, <laughs> hello, um, he, would, he would say, and him and, and a few other board members would say, it's too political. And I'm like, what do you, okay, like, what does that mean? It's pol our identities are political. We live in political realities. To say that whiteness is not political is, is absurd. That is simply not true. Um, so we've been pushing on the organization, but this is, is the year where we're gonna come out with a list of demands, and we're gonna actually do it right before the burn so that we can help increase public pressure because you know all the press is trying to write about Burning Man in August, but essentially, what we want is we want for the board to go through comprehensive anti-racism training. We want the board to in the next, to make a commitment that between now and the next 10 years, they set a goal for the inclusion of people of color. And they set a workable goal um, that they allocate their low income tickets to um, folks of, of color or try to figure out a way how to really measure who the low income tickets are going to. Um, that they do through the theme camps, some kind of incubator or something very intentional to support the creation of camps run by people of color and they have a way of measuring that. Um, and I think there's one more element. Oh yeah, that they prioritize programming, uh, anti-racist programming and um, not just anti-racist, basically inclusion, <laughs> inclusion and diversity program as part of one of their main offerings in center camp. So we are going to give them that. We're gonna send it to the board. We're gonna send it to the staff because at this point it's time to organize and we're gonna ask white folks in the staff and we're gonna ask all of you actually, anyone to sign on and say like, y'all gotta get it together, homies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we need help collecting data. We need help collecting the incidents because I did see the drumming incident that went viral. The where there was like some what? Yeah. Okay, I didn't see that. So it would be great to actually just get some of the data to help contextualize. But really, the camp census has a lot of great stuff. So that that's how we're working with them, and we think that at this point, like we have now been in conversation almost three years, and it's just it's not moving. It's not moving, and. When we get emails that say that their number one concern is um, 
plug and play camps. I'm like, yo, do you see what's happening in the world? Like, do you really see who we have as president? Like, it's now or never. So that that is some of the strategies. And we hope to, as we make it public, we encourage all of you to organize yourselves, especially if you have camps who are really, I know Burners Without Borders is actually, you know, Burners Without Borders, y'all were at Standing Rock. I know y'all are going to the border. I think that's a great example, actually, of how there are elements in the Burning Man community that is pushing harder. And believe me, they get pushback. I know y'all get pushback from the inside. Um, but that's what it's going to take. It's going to take for people to say, we're reinventing this. We're, we're moving forward. In terms of the, does somebody want to take the ascribed versus elected identities? Would uh, unpack that a little bit? Um, <laughs> I was like, I can. Go for it. Actually, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind um, unpacking that a little bit, just to make sure I'm clear. Yeah, um, just um, um, the intersectionality between um, sorry about that. the intersectionality between um, kind of um, elective identities or something like Burning Man. We all elect to participate in the subculture. It's not something that we were born into. It is not something that, even if we may look alternative, um, we may be able to pass as not a member of the Burning Man community. And so an ascribed identity is something that society and the systems of oppression that exist and the hierarchical structures that exist say this is who you are and this is how I'm going to find you by, whether or not that's something that you identify as a salient part of yourself. And so historically um, in this um, country, a lot of people who identify with, uh, with a lot of marginalized ascribed identities have often less um, less percentage of engagement in elective subcultural communities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really fascinated just around, around uh, that. Okay. So um, I think a useful thing, a useful thing actually all of you can practice is to, um, this definition of privilege, which I'm gonna share is very useful, which is that um, privilege is the amount of safety that you can access at any time. And understanding that the world is an unsafe place. So for me as a cisgender woman, American, um, when I'm walking down the street, I have a different access to safety than um, uh, a white identified male. And I have a very different access to safety than, say, William, who might be walking down the street at night as well. So um, as, a wo as a person that moves around the world with a trans identity, um, what is the access of safety they can access? What is the level of safety they can access? What's the level of safety that somebody um, who is in a wheelchair can access at any given time, or somebody who's undocumented? So to understand questions of privilege, I think, then helps is that when you do have privilege, whether you might have American privilege, you might have white privilege, male privilege, straight privilege, cis privilege, ableist privilege, um, how do you access that in order to help create safety for other people? And so in relation to um, identities, I think that what, what you said, you said it so well, was that um, there are identities where people don't really have a choice, that you get put into a certain sort of category. Uh, and I think that to, to use guidelines around privilege helps you understand whether your identity is elected or if it's ascribed and how can you leverage even parts of your identity to actually help organize um, other people or help create more uh, safe environments? Cool. Um, yeah, so, so long as yeah. So, thank you for for clarifying. I wanted to make sure I was following. Um, I think also to bring to to, to bring like a race lens to both both the, the elected and, and ascribed uh, identities, right? So. Um, like I do racial equity work, but we do we we, we work in various different issues. We do inter, a lot of interse intersectionality work. Sorry, um, but we have to start with race, right? That, that's the point of intersectionality. You start with race, like that is a lens, because we are all racialized beings. Even though race is, is a myth, even though race is not something we, that was made up, uh, there are real life implications uh, because of racism, racism, right? Like there are real um, like black and brown men overpopulating prisons. That that is that is a result of Something that isn't that isn't real, being manifested in right, being built into these systems and structures, um, and so even with with elected um, identities, I think that to maintain that lens of like, what, okay, what does it mean then to be? Like, I mean, so I identify as a burner. What does it mean then for me to be a racialized burner? For me to be a brown or a Chicano burner, um, and that I have a lot of questions to answer when I go home, right? Um, and um, but I have to constantly thinking about what that means 
right? Uh, what it means for me to be a hearing person. My partner is deaf and his children are deaf. Um, and, um, and I move in deaf circles and I'm constantly having to remember uh, or reminded that I am a hearing person. That is my identity and that I'm a brown hearing person, right? And that there are implications for that, linguistic implications, for instance. Um, so to be constantly having that, that, that race lens that we are at all times racialized beings. We, like, no one is ever just queer, right? You, like we are, all, we are all who we are at all times. Um, and I think, I think that would apply to elected identities as well. Like, okay, so you are a burner. What kind of burner are you? Right, like what, yeah. Who are the people of your burners? Yeah. And it kind of wraps into this question of like identity of like who is your we too that is again part of I think a larger reframe of the conversation that's really important and I think it partially answers the first question to tie this in of like well how can Bernie Man show up to help black burners do this and to me that's not the question is how can Burning Man show up so that Burning Man is in integrity with what Burning Man says it is? This is not an issue about black and brown and indigenous people. This is honestly an issue about white people and whiteness because it's whiteness that fills up the jail, not black and brown people, right? There's a cause and an effect and we often frame things from talking about the effect rather than really getting at the cause. And so I think that that in all of this, like all of these questions is a really big way to just kind of like open up more creative thinking and problem solving and some other like unexpected, previously unseen ways to address this stuff when you switch that around because it really is an inverted issue in the way that we talk about it. And I, I love what you said because I also think that, um, that white people need to heal, that it's part of your healing to undo the systems of oppression for hundreds of years have dominated in the world since colonialism and have, have that stuff just doesn't go away. It's just like it's in our bodies. It's in your bodies too. It's, it's, it's in, it has to be worked out. Just like patriarchy, you gotta, that toxic masculinity shit, you gotta intentionally get it out. And so I do think, I love what you're saying and maybe we can think about how we talk about this to the Burning Man board, but that white folks need to heal in, and, and in healing and in making Burning Man more inclusive, it's going to transform everyone. It's going to be a gift to be able to say, I mean, just imagine, I like, you know, like, just like, I could not live in a world where black people are 1%. I'm just like, are you serious? It's, it's just, world. it's a sad world. <laughs> it's a sad world. So, so I, 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 I love that. That's, that's very, um, really beautiful. Uh, cool. Any more uh, questions? Okay, here we have Thank you. I have a question about reframing the Burning Man origin stories through a racial justice lens and like thinking about Cacophony and Suicide Club and even Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, knowing like from the photos that it was all white people and at what point and how can we look at those stories and talk about the systems that were in place then that made it so that Burning Man grew up white. I would love to hear y'all's perspective on that. Uh, reframing origin stories of Burning Man. Hello. Um, as a white passing woman, um, I contribute definitely to a very white looking camp <laughs> um, and uh, we recently just had six people leave our camp, and I asked our camp, can we try to just fill this with six people of color? Um, and I got a lot of pushback saying, that sounds like you're trying to cast for like people of color. How, what are some ways that you explicitly can search, encourage, and empower people of color to join your camp without it seeming like you're trying to find a token person? In your in your in your space. Yeah, um, I think my question is is somewhat related. Um, so, um, you know, one thing that I found in organizing, I think that like K Viva speak like the experience that Jahan spoke to, uh, like speaks to this to a certain extent. Like sometimes, like if you're part of a majority white camp. And you're like, I want to be inclusive, you know. <laughs> you're like, I want, like, you know, from like 
an excellent place and from like a sort of like right feeling place. But then like, you know, uh, it can, you can sometimes find that like, because you're a majority white camp, people of color don't want to join your camp, right? They don't want to like, they don't, they don't want to access the experience because there isn't the feeling of like uh, safety of like being seen, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm curious, like for folks who might be part of or running majority white camps, like what are the strategies that um, y'all would name um, for, you know, like contributing to a sense of like inclusion and uh, inclusiveness, um, whether that be, you know, and sort of like pointing towards uh, part of my sense of the answer, uh, you know, whether that be like, uh, you know, through your camp or through like the wider Burning Man experience in some way. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off with, um, I, I think, just some of the, the, the strategies. So, so first, th this is, this, I want to name, this is a complicated thing because in reality, this is why the organization needs to do something about it as an organization so that it can work with its team, theme, theme camps. But I would say number one is to have a discussion on Racism 101. Trippy um, is an excellent resource. Trippy teaches white allyship workshops. Um, I think maybe even a work group of camps get educated first on the foundations of racism 101 and how to undo racism. And what is it? Institutional, interpersonal, all the different, there's four forms of, of racism. So I think starting with some education so that people can begin to think about how, um, how, how whiteness really works within just everyday dynamics. Two I would say is that one of the hardest things that our members have uh, just, it's so hard to go to Burning Man. It's really hard, complicated, all the dates, all that stuff. I would suggest to try to get gifted tickets or try to get to things like, like a sort of support package where you can say, hey, um, we can contribute by help getting you a ticket, but also facilitating your travel there will help set you up because often for a lot of folks of color, it's gonna be their first time there. Um, so really, uh, and this is why your camp should commit to it from an anti-racism point of view because that way it's it's seen as like this is long-term work and these are steps we're going to begin to take but in order to take the steps we need to first bring in more voices um and and, and also that way it's not just about the new people who come it's about how the people who've been holding that space receive them right and so um yeah uh i would also say um to have access to things that people of color programming. So we do all kinds of programming. We do Black Lives Matter workshops. We do workshops on the migra immigration crisis, make your own butterfly wings kind of thing. Um, so to be able to offer to your uh, folks, hey, these are all of these other things, Selena party, all this, uh, Black Burners meetup that, are, that, that you, you may be interested in. So do the work of gathering the data. What other stuff would you say? Yeah, and I would say um, have a, conver a frank conversation with camp and just ask, does it, does it matter? Is it important to you? Like, is it important to you? Like, if, if we're in a in majority or we're an all-white camp and we look around, does it matter to us that this is, this is who we are? Um, because, you know, like, in the way that sexism hurts men, racism hurts white people too, right? Like, it's, um, we all are experiencing um, lesser versions of our own humanity because of these and and really come so if it matters then what would it look and then start thinking about what would it look like for us to move as a camp holding the truth that it matters to us that people of color feel welcome that other people feel welcome here then then what is the work piece because you need to have that some kind of a driving vision or like a compelling shared image um and but it has to come from a conviction like it matters to me and if it doesn't matter to you then that's a conversation to have and then people can decide what they want to do around that right but but without that conversation and then just recruiting people, then it, it, can, it can be really hostile. It can be a really, really painful experience, certainly for people of color and for the white folks who were kind of on the fence who were just like, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Let's you know, have a, you know, some black or brown people here. And then shit starts to blow up because we didn't do the homework. We didn't do the work beforehand. Um, and then, again, and often we know when we do uh, experiments like that, then what ideas we have about white people and about people of color kind of get reinforced. Right, and that's only because we didn't do the work. Um, I think what I'm gonna kind of focus on is just 
a few things of like how to demonstrate welcome when when the camp is already majority white to me one like take a stand like you were saying like the black lives matter poster the migration is beautiful people respond to that because they see the conversation that is relevant to them being talked about and so they gravitate towards it so have symbols have colors have things that are culturally relevant and again in a way where you've done the homework because i think we heard on the way in here the case of like somebody just like putting up <laughs> a big like bob marley flag or like a jamaica flag and so they and they saw it it was a person of color and they went thinking like they were going to like find their people but they're like no no this is just a lot of people smoking weed this is not what <laughs> like this is not what i was coming for so to be thoughtful about that too, but also like be aware, you know, is like are all of the things that are kind of represented symbolically, are they mostly connected to whiteness? Or, you know, just have, again, those real conversations about that. Um, and thinking in, like in terms of that numbers question, maybe thinking about ratios rather than representatives. So like what is the balance, the overall balance in the room? Not just like how do we, have a voice represented because it's not about representation like there's a way that representation is kind of disconnected from just like having the folks who are most impacted in the conversation and like if that like you were saying about yeah the numbers um and then last piece is just you know that there's a part of it that's anti-racist but there's also a part of it that's pro-liberation and that I think, again, when you think about it as being like anti-racist, it's just, it triggers something inside of people. And they kind of don't want to approach it. But when you really just get that it's like, this is for everybody. White folks are not well being racist. It's not healthy. So that addressing these issues is not about doing something for somebody else. It's about taking care of yourself, ta taking care of your own spirit, taking care of your own peace of mind. And that's how a lot of people, like people of color, see it. And we, we're holding that yes and, and we're kind of waiting. And this is, I'm not speaking on behalf of all people of color at all. This is my interpretation <laughs> of a lot of stories I've heard and my own experience. But that, there, that yes and is there, that we're like, yes, white friend, we want to be friends with you. That's why we're here. But we can't when, there, when that, part, that level of toxicity of that stuff is up it becomes not healthy for us. And so it's like, yeah. I actually just had an idea, which is something maybe, especially some camp leads can get together on, but it would be awesome to have like a pilot of mostly uh, camps that are like mostly white to get together and do like some learning together. So maybe where you say like, hey, let's take some workshops together. Let's have this discussion together. Um, and let's begin to have maybe an element of our programming be something where we can um, begin to actually hold conversations. So for example, you could lead, uh, you, you could lead a, a white ally workshop and talk to folks um, who may want to come be a guest in your camp for a day. Maybe they don't have to camp with you. Maybe they can come be a guest um, and you, you know, thank them in some amazing way. Uh, where you, you can all begin to talk about an issue that affects communities of color, right? So Black Lives Matter 101, um, immigration, uh, how to be a pro-migrant um, you know, activist 101. But I think that, you guys, we're, we're like standing up to the status quo. This is the status quo. It takes so much work, but once the rock is moving, the rock is moving. And I think it would be really useful for some camps to sort of get together and see what kind of strategies can work. Because then if each of you, if like 10 camps get together and say, each of us are gonna bring two people of color, that means from the 10 camps, 20 new people of color can have their own support network that's separate from your camps, right? And so that's something, and this is why I think the organization needs to invest just the same level of thoughtfulness that they're thinking about the plug and plays. They should be thinking about this stuff and being like holding intentional space so that folks can learn because, you know, it's like I, it, it, some of these strategies um, may not work. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest, uh, and I had just thought of this idea because, you know, the, the thing is a lot of us are in like social movement work and especially um, recently after Trump got elected, it's been crazy. Like we're having to be at the border. Like, no, I'm serious. It's like we are so taxed and 
And like a lot of our, our we used to have a, um, a lot of white folks used to help us build our camp, but then now they're dealing with climate change because the 12 year thing is here. So we lost a lot of like our white builder crew, but we were like, damn, we should have like a service program or something where we can be like, hey, white allies, you want to come help us build our camp? And in exchange, you know, we can have do some like dialoguing or something. But the camps of color don't have the same infrastructure resources that white camps do, uh, or mostly white camps do that have been doing this for years. So I even think like a program where y'all help incubate or set up or catalyze new camps or help existing people of color camps. Because I remember when people of color camp was next door to us, man, they were struggling. And, and I was just thinking like, wow, there should be almost like a, a crew of, of, of white burners who want to do service to um, camps who are, have majority uh, members from disenfranchised communities. So, so that's an idea. Uh, questions, yeah. Uh, mine is more of a, a comment and just want to offer something to the group. Um, as a, uh, a member of the placement team, I've had an opportunity to speak recently with members of uh, camps in the Queerhood and sort of open um, dialogue with that community about how the placement team can better help uh, members from those camps and other uh, queer focused camps. And um, I'm just thinking maybe that's something that we can do with other communities uh, in Burning Man that feel left out by the org, at least as a, a starting place. So I wanna offer that. Um, we can talk after if we want contact information, but I'd like to offer that to the, to the group. So. Yeah, I just have a quick thing, which is um, I'm a camp lead and I did my placement app last year. There was a little box you could check that was like, do you want to host international people that have a hard time getting there and you know don't really have a lot of infrastructure? And I said yes. We ended up with like six international people we didn't know. They were amazing. We love them. Now we have all these international friends that we didn't know before and would not have had I not checked a box on an application. So maybe that will help placement in terms of like what could we do in this scenario that would be applicable. Sorry, my butt got stuck on the chair. Okay. Um, first of all, I love that we're having this conversation because we were just having it over lunch where he was like, as a white person, what can I do to bring more brown people into our camp? Um, I co-lead our camp and, uh, and Demma's our founder. And it is a camp of mostly uh, beautiful white male queer people. And I'm like five minorities in one. Um, but I also wanted to add to the space and to this conversation because I think it's important when we're like, a, you know, minorities talking about the minority point of view on Burning Man. I wanted to add a different shade of a minority point of view that um, I think some of it is also just cultural appeal. Like as the daughter of refugees who both showed up, like both my parents showed up with nothing in the U.S. And, you know, I didn't have AC until I went to college and I didn't have my own bed until I went to college. When I try to enroll my cousins at home to come enjoy this thing called Burning Man, um, they are often either put off by how liberal it is because as a half Hispanic, half Middle Eastern woman, like they just come from radically more conservative ideas. And like it freaks them out to think that men are maybe making out with men or whatever it is. And also when you are, you know, an immigrant family, 52 weeks a year, you don't have AC and you are struggling. So the idea of a seven day vacation that is also rough on your senses also puts you off. So I, I guess I just wanted to like create a little bit of nuance between the parts that feel like Burning Man is just a little racially exclusive versus the parts that just maybe don't appeal as much to some members of some cultures. And we were like talking about this over sushi and I was like, you know, my family, they will be at the all you can eat pork buffet. But if I tell them like, come to a sushi restaurant, it just doesn't necessarily appeal to where they are at right now. And I'm sure the cultural movement will lead to that. But I just want to like also kind of add that color. Thank you for giving me that. Yes, um, so I, I want to just say that we, we have to be careful not to stereotype communities. Like, we can't, immigrants are not one big group of people, Latinx people are not one big group of people, neither are black people. And so it, to say that a certain demographic may not want to come 
just like white people can be anything, people of color can be anything. We have a huge diversity of how we think, how we move in the world. And this is what Larry Harvey said, which was extremely problematic, which is that black people don't like to camp. That's not true. So I just think that it's, it's, it's rather, um, I think it's very, we should be careful not to tread that because that actually allows for a lot of bias to happen. And I would also say at this point in time, people of color are no longer a minority. People of color are becoming the majority mm -hmm. in this country and they're the majority in the world. So this idea that somehow we're minorities is not factual, it's just not. And, and I think that especially when you look at spaces where people of color are not represented in the ways that they are around the world, it tells you something um, about the power dynamics. Uh, but okay, so we are close to time, so let's do a, a, a sort of wrap up on, we have five minutes, great. So, um, so just in terms of closing us out and, and actionable um, items is that um, we, we heard that there could be some support from placement. Um, I would really encourage uh, that uh, those of you, especially who've been here for years, camp leads, try to think about how to organize your camps, your districts, there are ways to do that. I'm sure that Burning Man, the theme camp folks, um, can, would be interested in supporting that based on the conversations I've had with folks. There's a lot of curiosity on what to do, and so I think it doesn't hurt to introduce new ideas. Um, we, uh, Lorenzo's gonna be tomorrow on a plenary panel with Coop, from Comfort and Joy. Oh, but that's the other strategy I forgot to suggest. Do a service element to your camp, like Comfort and Joy collected canned foods for the uh, Bayuta tribe, right? You know, you can do something, collect things for migrants at the border. I mean, come on, they, they're, the, okay. Migrants at the border, you know how much they would benefit from Burning Man gear right now? The amount of camps being set up there is, it's just ridiculous, ridiculous. So I know that Burners Without Borders, y'all have some connections. There's do the research. There's many groups who are collecting donations, but that's a way for your camp to begin to at least learn about impacted communities, right? There's also things you can do. We didn't even get to talk about carbon footprint, but you know, start thinking about if it, how to have a less of a of a of an impact, and think about indigenous frontline communities who are fighting to get oil out of their communities. How you can support them? So it, it doesn't just have to be the physical presence of people of color. Your camp can also do something to begin to get it into the habit of, you know, learning about other communities. We are working on a uh, letter to Burning Man and the other um, folks uh, camps who have big populations of people of color, we're also working on that. I'm gonna, uh, we'll have our contact info, but if folks have any so kind of data that they would like to share, or if folks are interested in like um, activating some of y'all's camps, it would be great if we could also get like, you know, white allies and Burning Man to being like, hey Burning Man, get it together kind of thing. That would be awesome. Other um, action items next step, what is your, your call to action? Um, I was sorry, I'm like sitting here still integrating a lot of things. I think mine is going to be the do your homework and always question your narrative because even like I'm sitting with this question of the cultural thing and I'm like the indigenous people are land people. That's what it means to be indigenous and so many people who have been displaced are being displaced from places far more connected to land as culture then we are here and yet the narrative here is that it's white people who are into that where it's like black and brown people have been recycling far before it was a national movement and yet are somehow left out of that conversation. So, th so to just do the homework, do your homework and always question your narrative because the story that you have been given about how the world works and how it runs serves somebody's agenda and it's usually not the agenda of the world we're trying to build. And I would add, um, just, uh, so I do uh, also a lot of training on appreciative inquiry that um, uh, is a approach to doing organizational development work, but I would suggest going back to your camps and a asking the question, um, you know, when was a time when you felt like you fully belonged in your camp? So like, so like, like, like because white people aren't bad, white camps aren't bad, right? Like it's, uh, so it's to come from a place of like, it's not an adversarial world, but to, to ask that question, when was the time when you felt you fully belonged here? And then what led to that, to that possibility? And like, maybe you could start to expand the imagination. What would it look like for people of color to, to experience a sense of belonging as well? Like, wh and maybe ask people of color if you, there are in your camp, when was a moment in this all white camp that you felt that you belonged? 
and, and what was it about that? Because how do we start cultivating that thinking, a way of, of, of seeking possibilities for belonging? Great. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll be here to uh, answer a few more questions. And you can find us um, on, on Facebook, our Camp Que Viva Camp. Thank you. Yay!